up Psalm chapter 100, please. Starting at verse 1. We're not going to start there. It's too early for that. <laughs> Go down to verse 2. It says, shout to the Lord, all the earth. I'm not shouting yet. <clears throat> Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with singing and with joy. Next verse. Acknowledging that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Next verse. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. You can keep it here. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Let's get up on our feet this morning. This is the verse I want to focus on as we enter in. There's a way to enter in with God. Say enter in. So with spiritual things, it's no different than having success in the natural realm with natural things. There's always a way to do things. That's why God told Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, if you'll follow this book of instruction, then you'll have good success in everything that you do. The Bible is a book of instruction, but it's got layers of revelation. So there's natural instruction or instruction on the first layer, but then there's prophetic or supernatural spiritual revelation that will give you instruction on how to enter into a spiritual atmosphere. Every spiritual answer requires a spiritual atmosphere. So you set an atmosphere for God to move. Amen? Amen. You study the tabernacle. You study the temple. You study everything that God had always had his people build from start to finish, and it was always a place for his spirit, an atmosphere for his spirit to move. So if God doesn't have an atmosphere to move, then he can't move in these atmospheres. But we're going to set the atmosphere this morning. I heard that Thursday morning is typically the morning when everybody is tired. You've been zip lining, you've been swimming. I know, I was doing it too. But this is the time where we can get spiritual. Believe it or not, that when your flesh is actually the weakest is when God is the strongest. Remember, Paul said, in my weakness is when you're made strong. So we're going to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise this morning. The reason why it says in Psalm chapter 100 to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise is because when God had Moses build the tabernacle, there were three entryways into the Holy of Holies. Number one was called the gate or the way. And you entered into God's gate with thanksgiving. You thanked the Lord as you went in. You brought offerings into the tabernacle. And then there was another gate called the court or the truth. The way, the truth. Yeah, there we go. Making sure I'm following myself. You got the gate, the courts, and then there was a veil that separated people from God's presence or the Ark of the Covenant called the life. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. The only way to the Father is through me. Because what he was actually telling his people is that in order to come through this gate, in order to come through this court, and in order to get through this veil, you need to come through me. So we're going to enter in this morning. Lift your hands up and just begin to pray to God and the Holy Ghost. Say, thank you, Lord. Thank him for everything that he's done this past week. Thank you, Jesus, that you've been moving. Thank you, Holy Ghost, that you're here in this place this morning. We praise you, Lord, for what you've done. We praise you for how you're moving already this morning. Thank you for the anointing. Robo bo side anamase e shodule di erebese. Everyone's full of the Holy Ghost now after last night. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Lift up your voice. Press in. Enter in. Enter in. Enter in. Redianamase, more, more, be filled this morning. Enter in this morning. Shure de Erebe, Yoranamasa, Robobose, Lady Erebe, Shokoradaba, Redianemese, Yedobo Lady Anamasa, Robobosa, slip on in this morning. Ha ha ha. Yeshoko Redi Erebe, Yola Male Dianamasa, Yor Roboboso, Redianamase. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that as your word goes forth this morning, that the implanted word will produce 30-fold, 60-fold, even 100-fold. Thank you, Lord, for your power as you start working already in this place. And everybody said, amen. amen. Go ahead. You can be seated. <clears throat> There's always a way to do things with God. He always has a system. He's always got a way. He always has a, a specific uh, path that you got to take in order to get an intended result. 
Go with me to Acts chapter 10. We're going to start here this morning. I kind of want to pick up where I left off the first service because I want a different direction. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. These morning sessions are more teaching sessions where we can get the word into you, especially after last night. You guys got nice and full of the Holy Ghost. People were stumbling everywhere. It's always a good sign. It's always a good sign. I heard somebody put it this way once. <clears throat> when you get full of the Holy Ghost and you're drunk in the spirit like that, it's actually God's anesthesia for what he's doing. He's actually perform performing surgery on your heart. So as you're laughing in the Holy Ghost, you don't understand what God's doing in your heart. He's removing things. The fire of God is burning things out. It's refining things. It's getting rid of things. Like Pastor Stan says, it's causing things to depart, and it's causing things to be imparted. So when you're laughing like that, it's just God's anesthesia so that you don't have to feel what he's really getting at the root of. And uh, you'll be amazed. You won't leave this camp the same way that you came. I've been joking about it all week, but it's serious. Every camp that you go to with young people like this is just a bunch of people like laying on top of each other, crying about their ex-boyfriend, crying about their ex-girlfriend, crying about their depression. But I didn't see any of that last night. None of that was here last night. In an atmosphere full of joy, you don't have any of that stuff. When you have an atmosphere of the Holy Ghost, none of that is here. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, no matter what anybody tells you. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. All right, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, look at this. Highlight it in your Bible. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Those are two separate things. They come together, but they're separate things. You can underline them. Second half of the verse, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. How many did he heal? All that were oppressed of the devil. So the Bible says that when God anointed Jesus, he had a purpose for the anointing. Last night, when you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Brother Jonathan laid hands on you, Pastor Stan laid hands on you, the Spirit of God came on you for a purpose. There's a purpose behind the anointing. The anointing is not, like Pastor Haken says, it's not to get you up there to make you look good. It's not to give you a platform. The power of God is not to just give you influence in the earth. It's to perform a purpose. And the purpose of the Spirit of God on Jesus was to go around doing good, first of all, number one, and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. That word doing good in the Greek, if you can put it back up on the screen, that word doing good in the Greek is the same word that we get the word philanthropist from. Doing good, being a philanthropist. I like to say it this way. When the anointing is in you and upon you, you become a Holy Ghost philanthropist. Anyone know what a philanthropist is? So a philanthropist is somebody that's usually extremely wealthy, that they've been very successful. They typically come from generational wealth. They've inherited a lot of money. And they're known as a philanthropist, their family is, because they give massive charitable donations. They tend to be self-sufficient, and they have abundance to give to every good work. Kind of sounds like 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So that word, doing good, being a philanthropist, is what the Spirit of God gives you the ability to do as you go around. So although Jesus was healing all that were oppressed, that's not all that he was doing. He was turning water into wine. He was multiplying fish and multiplying bread. He was going around bringing abundance everywhere that he went. He was a Holy Ghost philanthropist. So there's two things that happen originally or immediately when the Holy Ghost comes on you. Number one, you're given the power to go around doing good. Say doing good. That means whenever an opportunity comes up to do something good, you have the power to be the answer. Amen? So the anointing on your life gives you the ability to bring abundance into the room everywhere that you go. Abundance of joy, abundance of peace, abundance of happiness, abundance of finances, abundance of healing, abundance of every area of life. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life abundantly. You bring the abundant life of God everywhere that you go. That's why you're the light of the world. Every room that you go into, darkness flees. Sickness flees. Brother Jonathan told the story one time. I don't know if he told it this week or not, but uh, he told this story about a drug addict. 
a man that was addicted to heroin. He's a good friend of his. And he had led him to the Lord, and he backslid. And when he backslid, he went into this heroin house, and he called Brother Jonathan, and Brother Jonathan said, I'll be there in the morning. And when Brother Jonathan got there in the morning, he just sat by this man that was having heroin. Uh, I don't think he was overdosing, but he was having withdrawals in the morning. He was extremely shaky, and uh, he was not feeling too good. But as Brother Jonathan just sat down on the couch next to him, he said he just sat there and began to talk to him and listen to him. And the anointing on Brother Jonathan's life was so strong that the man that had heroin problems was sitting there, and he said, you know, just since you've been here, I already feel better. Just since you've been sitting here, just since you've been talking to me, I already feel the tremors starting to lift off of my body. So the Holy Ghost on you gives you the power to go around doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Now, if you could go to Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The first two things the anointing does, empowers you to be a Holy Ghost philanthropist and to go around doing good, healing all that are oppressed of the devil. There's a great man of God named Alexander Dowie, and uh, he was from Australia. He was a very rough man, grew up on a farm, and uh, I can't remember if it was somebody in his family or him. He got revelation of that verse, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, and uh, I want to say it was him, or maybe, I don't know, maybe his mom or something like that. Someone close to him was sick, and he said, Lord, what am I supposed to do? I know Jesus hasn't changed. I know he's a healer, so how am I supposed to handle this? And the Lord led him to that verse, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, that Jesus went around doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So he knew that day it was God's will for everybody to be healed. Well, fast forward a couple years later, he ends up moving to Illinois. He actually planted the city called Zion, Illinois. And they say that in his services, if you went into his tabernacle, all along the wall, they'd have wheelchairs, they'd have crutches, they'd have things from people that came in and got healed. And they used to, three services a day, this is what they did. This is powerful. They would take these massive tarps, and they'd have to fold them up, and they'd roll them out after rolling the tarp up. They'd roll it out in the morning for the first service, and he'd preach on the healing power of God. And they said that as he would preach, people would start coming up to the tarp as faith would enter into him. And they would stand on the tarp and people with, I'm talking like growths, tumors on their face, tumors on their body, huge like things that if you saw, it looked like a horror movie. And these people come up on the tarp and he would just walk down the line and he would just grab these tumors and rip them off of people's bodies. He'd just slap them and these warts and these growths would just fall off on the tarp. And they'd roll the tarp up at the end of the service. And then they'd take it in the back and they'd burn the tarp. And they'd do that three times a day. That's the power that is in Acts chapter 10 verse 38. So you got to know when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you've received power to go around doing good, healing all that are oppressed of the devil. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, listen to this. Jesus said there were a couple things that he was called to do when the anointing came on him. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Say the Spirit's upon me. Because he has anointed me. That word anointed means to smear, but it also means to consecrate. It means that when God anoints you, he puts you into the earth for a purpose. God anointed Jesus for a purpose, to go around doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, and to do what he's about to say, to preach the gospel to the poor. You can write that down. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Or another translation says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So the Spirit of God was upon Jesus to, number one, preach good news to the poor. Well, what's good news to the poor? You don't have to be poor anymore. Prosperity. Again, no matter what anybody tells you, that's the truth. So the anointing on you gives you the ability to preach to people and say, hey, the curse of the law is no longer. Jesus took poverty so that you might become rich. He took it on the cross, what he did in his death, burial, and resurrection. He paid the price for you. You don't have to be poor anymore. Your family doesn't have to be poor anymore. You actually carry wealth by the anointing of heaven. Number two, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. I think it was T.L. Osborne great evangelist said, there's a broken heart on every pew. Most of the time when you get into a church setting, 
when you're at school, when you're at work, there's going to be somebody around you that has a broken heart. They don't know the Lord. They've had crazy things happen. They've had their dad leave them. Their mom died. So, something crazy has happened in their life. God will actually use you to put their heart back together. I remember uh, when I had just gotten full of the Holy Ghost a couple of years ago, and I was fasting and praying for a while in my apartment. I told you guys a little bit about my testimony. When I was fasting and praying, I saw that I could operate in the word of knowledge, that it was a spiritual gift in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that God would give me supernatural knowledge to peek into somebody's life so I could be the answer to them. And so I started praying that the Lord would do that for me. And when I started praying that, I used to do personal training. I got a call from my buddy at college. He was a baseball player. And he said, Talon, I have this friend of mine, and uh, he wants to start gaining weight for baseball. I know that you help people gain weight. I know that you help people put on muscle. Would you help him out? And I said, well, sure. So he came over to my apartment. And when he came over to my apartment, I had never met this guy in my life. But the moment that he walked through my door in my apartment, all of a sudden, I started to know things about him that in the natural I should have never known. As he walked through my apartment door, all of a sudden, I knew that he struggled with alcohol. I knew his dad struggled with alcohol. I knew that he was depressed. I knew that he had anxiety, and I knew that he was worried that he was taking the same path that his dad took in life and that he didn't know what to do about it. And so as I'm sitting there, it's a very odd thing to just be like, hey, nice to meet you. I heard you're an alcoholic, but, you know. I didn't know the guy. I couldn't just confront him like that. So I, I sat there on the couch. I was just getting ready to know him. His name was Lane. I remember that. And I just prayed in my heart. I said, Lord, if this is you, which I know it is, I need an opportunity to talk to this guy in private. And the moment that I prayed that prayer in my heart, my buddy that brought him over got a phone call, and he stepped out of the room. And it was like word vomit just came out of my spirit. I said, hey, Lane, I don't know what your relationship with the Lord is like, but he just told me you're an alcoholic, your dad's an alcoholic, you got depression, you got anxiety, and you're worried that you're taking the same path that your dad took in life. Does any of that resonate? <laughs> and uh, he kind of just looked at me, and his eyes just swelled up with tears. And he held up this Mountain Dew can that he had brought into the apartment. And he said, this isn't Mountain Dew, this is straight vodka. I've been drinking this straight vodka for two weeks because my anxiety is so bad that I get panic attacks. And the only way that my panic attacks go away is by drinking this vodka. He said, I just got out of the hospital like a month ago because my depression was so bad that my organs were attacking themselves and I was about to die. And my dad was an alcoholic and it caused my parents to get divorced and I'm worried that I'm taking the same path that he took. Everything that the Lord had told me was exactly what was happening in his life. So God is actually looking by the Holy Ghost to use you to bind up the brokenhearted. And so as the Lord told me that, I just said, Lane, Thank you for telling me that, but God has an answer for you. And I told him my testimony. I told him everything that the Lord had done for me. He said the salvation prayer gave his life to the Lord, and I was able to handle that. The next night, this is my favorite part. The next night, I'm sitting there reading my Bible, and all of a sudden, I hear on my door. And I was like, what the heck is happening here? And he, like, busts open the door, and he runs into my bathroom with a big backpack on. And he just starts pulling out these alcohol bottles out of his backpack and dumping them down my drain. And so the Lord, not only will he bind up the brokenhearted, but he'll actually deliver you from every addiction that you had. Now, I didn't even lay my hands on him and say, hey, alcohol, get out. All I did was bind up the broken heart by the anointing. All I did was reveal that God wanted to do something about his situation, and the Lord used it to heal him, to deliver him, to set him free. Can you say amen? So God will anoint you to bind up the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives. I'll tell you another cool story. Deliverance is a big deal. So that was deliverance. Not only did his broken heart get, uh, get bound up, but he was delivered too. There was a time, right? this is right around the same season of life, where I was praying that the Lord would put somebody into my path. And the reason I'm telling you this is because I want you to start praying like this. After I told this story a couple of weeks ago, Taylor had texted me, and she said, Taylor, after you told that story and you encouraged me, to start praying that God would put people on my path, he started putting people in her path for her to share the gospel with. So when you start seeing that God is willing to use you like this and you start praying like this, God will put people in your path. You don't have to have a pulpit ministry. You don't have to have a TikTok ministry. You don't have to have a YouTube ministry. You just have to be willing to be used. You just have to know that God's anointed you as a Holy Ghost philanthropist to go around doing good and healing all that are oppressed. And so as I was praying, I said, Lord, I want you to put somebody in my path that needs to hear my testimony. And I got invited to go on this business trip with the guy that led me to the Lord. 
And as we're going on this business trip, we're driving down the road in Iowa, and it's mid-February. It's freezing outside. I'm talking like four degrees. It was so cold. And as we're driving, I see this drunk woman stumbling on the side of the road. It's probably nine o'clock in the morning. She's got leggings on. She's got boots on. She, she looked, I don't, I don't want to jump to conclusions, but she looked like a stripper. And she's walking down the side of the road. And uh, I could just tell that she had a late night. And she's kind of walking like this, kind of like how some of you were walking last night. And uh, as she was walking down the side of the road, I just, it came out of my spirit as we drove past her. And I'm from California. I don't pick people up on the side of the road. That's how you end up on TV. That's how you end up in a ditch. So we were driving past, and it just came up out of my spirit. And I said, Mike, I think we're supposed to pick her up. And he had the same reaction. He's like, what do you mean? Pick her up. But I said, I don't think she knows the Lord. And so we turned around, and we picked her up. And her name was Heather. She got in the back seat of the car. That's a, that's a terrible headliner. Preacher picks up stripper, right? Oh, my gosh. Don't worry. I was there with Mike. But um, she's in the back seat of the car. I don't know if she was a stripper. She never told us. She just looked like one. But she's in the back seat of the car. And when she was in the back seat, the moment that she sat down, I could smell alcohol. And it was thick. Like, I could tell that she was not doing too good. And she just, be- immediately, she just began to pour out her heart. Her name was Heather. She just started saying, I've got an abusive boyfriend. Uh, he's a drug addict. He's an alcoholic. He kept me away from my kids. She said, I have an 11-year-old and a 12-year-old waiting at home for me right now. They've been alone all night. I haven't been able to get home to him. I wasn't able to pick him up from the bus stop. And I don't even know if they're all right because he took my cell phone. I can't get a hold of my kids. And uh, so she's just pouring her heart out to us. And Mike looked up in the mirror and he said, Heather, I think God sent us to find you today. And she just broke down and began weeping in the back seat of the car. And after she brought herself back together, she said, you know, I grew up in the church. And when I grew up in the church, I had always wanted to be in the ministry when I got older. She said, I started helping with Sunday school as I got a little bit older. And I met this guy in the church. And I didn't realize that he wasn't a real Christian. He was just in there to get me. And so when he met her, he started getting her hooked on alcohol, started getting her hooked on drugs, and eventually pulled her out of the church. And she said, I haven't even prayed to God in three years. And this morning, I was at a restaurant with this man, and I remember sitting at the table. And she said, when I was sitting at that table, they they, uh, were getting ready to have breakfast. He walked away from the table, and she said, as I was sitting on the table, I said, God, if you're still there, will you get me out of this situation? And she said, I had this overwhelming urge to get up, leave the table, and just start walking home. So she said, I got up, I left my bag, I left everything, and I just started walking home. And 30 minutes later, you picked me up and say, God sent you. So God is looking to use you like that. If you'll just pray and believe that God's going to use you to be an answer to people, God will use you like that. You just got to be willing to be used. If you're willing to know that God has anointed you to be the person that will bind up a broken heart, to bring deliverance to the captives, to know that you're the reason that God has you on the earth to bring revival to this generation, you'll do it. You'll go for it. You just got to be willing to be used. Say this, I'm willing to be used. Praise God. So we tell our testimonies, and uh, she gives her life to the Lord. In the backseat of the car, she says the, the sinner's prayer, the moment that she gave her life to Jesus in the backseat of that car, the smell of alcohol left the car. She was totally delivered of alcoholism, right in the backseat of the car. And as we pull up to her house, this is what got me. I try not to cry because it's deep. As we pulled up to her apartment, her little girl ran out, one of them, the 11-year-old. And when she ran out, she like stopped in her tracks and her mom was smiling. She said, Mom, I've never seen you smile like this before. And she like ran up to me and she hugged me. And uh, I'd never met this girl before, but I just said, do you know why your mom is smiling like this? And she said, Jesus. That was it. I don't don't know how she knew. I don't know. She just said, Jesus. She got totally set free just from one encounter in the backseat of the car. So God is willing to use you as a Holy Ghost philanthropist, not just to bring abundance, but to bind up the brokenhearted and to set the captive free. Amen? Amen. All right, let's finish this scripture real quick. Preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. That's important to know. You got to realize that a lot of people that are addicted, that they're under the oppression of the devil, they never intended to be in that situation. They're actually, they're in bondage, they're in chains. 
That's why the anointing that's on your life will actually destroy the heavy yoke on somebody else's life. But they're scared that they don't want to tell anybody this is what's going on because they don't think you have an answer. They've tried answers. They've tried AA. It doesn't work. They've tried smoking weed for anxiety. It doesn't work. They've tried all these other remedies, and they don't work. So oftentimes, they feel like what you got won't work. But when you tell them that it does work, then they'll start opening up to you, and you'll be the answer in their life. Hallelujah. Praise God. So I want to see God use you just like that. To set at liberty those who are oppressed and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord's favor. Glory to God. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6. Now I'm going to pick up where I left off the other night because I think this will, help, <clears throat> this will help you. These are a couple things that I wish I would have known right when I got full of the Holy Ghost. Say God's a rewarder. Can you pull up Hebrews 11.6 on the screen, please? God is a rewarder. Thank you, Lord. You're a rewarder. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. So he's the God of the Bible. He's the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. He's the God of the covenant. And that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I'm going to show you three ways to diligently seek God this morning, and you're guaranteed to get a reward every time you do it. Guaranteed to do a reward, get a reward every time you do these things. Again, I covered the other morning that there's needs, there's wants, there's desires, and then there's rewards. We know God supplies all of our needs according to his riches and glory. We know that the Lord is our shepherd. We do not want we know that if we delight ourselves in the Lord, he gives us the desires of our heart. But I'm going to show you how to get heavenly rewards in this life and in the life to come. Matthew chapter 6, we'll start at verse 1. Be sure that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So God is a rewarder. He's looking to reward you. We know how not to get rewarded. Anytime that you're looking to do something for the approval of man, you'll never be approved or rewarded by God. Anytime that you're looking to give, anytime that you're looking to get acknowledged by a man, God can't acknowledge you because you're looking for that approval, that validation from mankind instead of from the Lord. That's how pride gets in. Verse number two, therefore, when you do your charitable deeds, it doesn't say if, when you do your charitable deeds, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be honored by men. I can't remember what translation it is, but in one of the love chapter translations, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, one of the translations says, love does not seek its own honor. Remember, Jesus, when he came, he even told the people, I don't seek my own honor, but there is one that seeks my honor. You'll never have to seek your own honor when you're anointed by God. God will honor you. You honor up, you honor down, you honor all around, but you never have to seek your own honor. God will take care of that part for you. So never feel like you have to do anything in order to be rewarded by men. Aim for heavenly rewards here in this life and the life to come. Can I get an amen? amen. Truly I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do your charitable deeds, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deeds may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret, I want you to highlight that and underline it in your Bible. Your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. I want you to underline that and highlight that in your Bible. So what you do in secret, God is not looking to reward you in secret. God's not going to give you, when you give, God's not going to give you secret wealth. God's not going to give you a secret house. He's not going to give you a secret car. God will reward you openly. When you do what God's word says, his reward comes openly. Number one, your father sees in secret. He's watching what you do. You never have to blow a trumpet. He's watching when you give. So number one is giving. The number one way to experience the reward of God in your life financially is by your giving. Can you pull up on the screen 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 10? I know we're all young here. I don't know if... Most of you have jobs or not, but you will one day. This is one thing that you can never forget. Honor God with your money always. Always be a tither. Always be a giver. The only way to have financial covenant with God is by keeping the tithe. 
Doesn't matter what anybody says, the tithe is holy. It was God's, it is God's, it'll always be God's. It was in the Garden of Eden, it'll be in heaven, there will always be a tithe. It will always be a tithe. Honor God with your finances. 2 Corinthians 9, do you have that? But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able. Say God is able. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance, say an abundance, not just enough, not a little less than enough, not a little more than enough, always have an abundance for every good work. The psalmist said, you anoint my head with fresh oil, my cup overflows. It's not full, it overflows. Praise God. Verse 9. As it, is, as it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor. Verse 10. His righteousness endures forever. That's verse 9, verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed that you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. I'll tell you this quick testimony because I, I, gotta, I gotta move along here. <clears throat> the first time, one of the first times, I'll tell you the first time I tithed and one of the first times I gave a sacrificial offering like that where I sowed bountifully. The first time I tithed and I had revelation of tithing, uh, it didn't make sense to the natural mind because it doesn't. I heard somebody put it this way. Anytime somebody asks you to give, you know it's not the devil speaking to you because John chapter 10 says that the thief comes to steal. He doesn't come to give. So anytime a preacher, anytime somebody is preaching to you about giving, you know they're not preaching of the devil, they're preaching of the Holy Ghost because God so loved the world that he gave. The devil steals, the devil takes, God's a giver. So anytime somebody's talking to you about giving, you know it's from the Lord. So somebody told me about the tithe a number of years ago, and I remember I'd gotten a check from work. It was my first $1,000 check that I'd gotten uh, from doing sales. And uh, I was so happy about it. I was like, man, $1,000, I could get like 100, no, probably 500 candy bars. But I had $1,000 in my hands, and I had no idea what to do with it. But the guy that had led me to the Lord, and I thank God for this, he said, Taylor, you know, $100 of that goes to God. The tithe, and he taught me about the tithe. So I took that 10%, I took $100 out of it, and I gave it to the church that Sunday. Three days later, I had won a bonus at work that I didn't even realize I was eligible for, and it was a $1,000 bonus. And I believe that the Lord turned that tithe into that $1,000 like that to reveal to me that his word is true, that tithing works, that when you come into covenant with God financially, he'll always show up on time. So giving is the number one way to see reward in your life. The Bible says a generous man stands on his generosity. Your generosity will give you a platform to stand on. Your gift will make room for you. When you're a generous person, you will never regret it. Number two, verse five, praying. When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, enter your closet, and I want you to get this, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret. Say in secret. I'll give you a spiritual secret right here. God is already waiting for you in the secret place. He doesn't show up once you get there. He's actually waiting for you in the secret place. Why do you think Daniel had a specific location that he went to and prayed at three times a day? Jesus had specific locations that he went to and he prayed at three times a day. There are spiritual places where you set up, you consecrate them, you make them holy, and God is actually already there waiting for you to go and pray. So your father who is in secret is already there waiting for you to come and to pray. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. I'm going to tell you the reward for your prayer life. It's the anointing. You can write that down. The reward for your prayer life is the anointing. That's the price that you pay for the oil. There's an old saying that says, a sinning man doesn't pray, and a praying man doesn't sin. 
Your prayer life will determine how holy you live. It'll help. It'll help determine how holy you are, and it'll determine the kind of vessel that you are and the kind of oil, the amount of oil that you're able to hold. The word anointing means to smear. So it was, it was used when they would smear oil on sheep, when they would smear oil on the kings, the prophets, and the priests. That's the anointing oil of God. Well, your father who is in the secret place, when you go spend time with him and when you pray, he rubs off on you. We'll put it that way. You get smeared by the Holy Ghost in your closet. I feel the anointing stronger when I pray than when I preach. I feel the anointing stronger when I pray than when anybody else preaches. That's how you want to live your life. You never want to lose your prayer life. You never want to lose the anointing, that intimacy with God. You got to have a solid prayer life, and it says that he'll reward you openly for that. When you have a good prayer life and you consecrate time, you consecrate a place to be with God every single day, he'll reward you openly. He'll start sending you people to be the answer to. He'll start giving you an opportunity to preach. He'll give you the oil that's necessary to change your generation. Can I get an amen? Praise God. So number two, praying. Your father who is in secret will reward you openly. And the reward is what? The anointing. And I'll give you this one with it, verse seven. But when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. Brother Jonathan quoted that last night. For they think that they will be heard for their much speaking. Do not be like them, for your father knows what things you have need for before you ask him. This will shock you. Your prayer life is not going into the closet and telling God to supply your needs. He already knows what you need. You don't pray because you have needs. You pray because you're spending time with God. The Lord, he has already given you and supplied all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Number three, starting at verse 16. Moreover, when you fast. Number three, fasting. Giving, praying, fasting. Brother Jonathan said this last night, but I'll, I'll repeat it. If you're not 18, I don't recommend fasting. Wait till you're 18, but uh, I'll, le I'll leave that up to you and the Lord. But I do not endorse fasting until you're about 18 years old. When you turn 18, go for it, but I'm going to tell you what fasting will do for you in a second. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces so that they may appear to men to be fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you will not appear to men to be fasting. But to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. I want you to write this down. God will always reward me openly. He's never looking to reward you secretly, not for your giving, not for your praying, not for your fasting. People will look at you and they'll say, this person is different. They will know it. They will know that you're different. God will reward you openly every single time. If you could pull up Isaiah chapter 58, verse 8. Your fasting crucifies your flesh. It puts your flesh under so that your spirit is in a position of authority again in your life. And I taught you guys the other day, the devil floats around in the soulish realm. He messes with your mind, your will, and your emotions. But when you operate out of the spirit, you become a drinker instead of a thinker. So you're not messing around in the soulish realm anymore. You move up higher. You're seated in heavenly places at that level where you don't operate in the soulish realm. The soulish realm becomes under your feet. You have Isaiah 58.8. This is what will happen in your fasting. You can write this down. Isaiah chapter 58 is a chapter all about fasting. It tells you how to fast correctly. This is what will happen. Then your light shall break forth like the morning when you fast. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. I want you to highlight that in your Bible. Go there quickly, and I'll close with this this morning. When you fast, there's three things that happen. Start back at the beginning of the verse for me. Your light will break forth. That word light is revelation knowledge. When you fast, you'll get fresh revelation knowledge. What did Daniel get when he fasted? He needed an answer from the Lord. He needed a revelation from God. He needed a word from the Lord. So when Daniel was fasting, he got fresh revelation. The angel of the Lord brought the word of the Lord to him. The moment that you start fasting and praying, God has already sent your answer for you. He's already sent your revelation for you. 
So revelation will break forth like the morning. Number two, your healing shall spring forth speedily. Did you know that they've proven after 72 hours of fasting, doing a water fast, that your immune system totally regenerates itself? That every cell in your immune system actually recreates in 72 hours, a three-day fast. So your healing actually springs forth speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you, meaning that, like I said, a praying man doesn't sin and a sinning man doesn't pray. And this is what I want you to highlight. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Say this with me. The glory of the Lord will be my rear guard. God's glory will follow you everywhere that you go. And it won't be my might, it won't be by power, but it'll be by God's spirit. Everywhere that you go, when you walk into the room, God's glory is there. When you start preaching, God's glory is there. When you start working, God's glory is there. People will feel his presence everywhere that you go. The price for a strong anointing is fasting and prayer. God's glory will be your reward. God is a rewarder, and he's rewarding you with his glory. Can I get an amen? Well, That's about all I have. (laughs) Well, let's stand up real quick. I got about five minutes. Let me pray with you. So there's a way to do things with God. There's always a way to do things with God. There's a way to give. There's a way to fast. There's a way to pray. And to have good success when you do it. The way not to have good success is to do anything for the approval of man. You never have to be approved by man. You're already approved by God. I heard somebody say say it this way once. How much is a person worth? If the Bible says, what is it for a man to gain if he loses or if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? So a man's soul is worth more than the whole world. You have nothing to gain if you, if you gain the whole world but lose your soul. So there's a way to be rewarded by God. There's a system that God has in, in store for you to have good success in every area of your life. In your giving, in your fasting, and in your praying. And most importantly, I want you to focus on this, on going after the anointing. Now you live holy. You build everything that you do on the word. Your life must be built on the word. That's what I taught you yesterday. But I remember fasting and praying last year, and the Lord told me, Talon, if you'll just seek the anointing, everything else will follow. Everything is found in the anointing. The Bible says three times in the New Testament, I believe, there's riches in the anointing, riches in the glory. There's riches in the glory. So if you'll seek after the anointing, the power and presence of God, you'll always be supplied for. You'll always have enough. You'll live in abundance. You'll be self-sufficient in everything, and you'll be the answer. God's anointing on your life will make you a Holy Ghost philanthropist to your generation. You just need the anointing. Say, I just need the anointing. Last night, that's what you got. You got the anointing. You were anointed with fresh oil. You got full of the Holy Ghost. Stay in that place all the time. Fast, pray, seek more of the anointing everywhere that you go. Every single day, just want to be, want to be anointed. Choose to be anointed. Don't just want it. You got to choose it. Let's lift our hands and pray one more time. I want to pray a little bit. Those that got filled with the Spirit, pray in the Spirit. Press in, press in. Press in, press in. Robo bo se die rebese, yes anamale, yes odo le die rebese, rama ma se ke odo bo sho, rana ma sa, robo bo se, ye la ma le de rebese, robo bo suro rabase, yes o no le de anama se die, more glory, 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 just press in for the glory, ask God to touch you with his power, rebi amase, yes o no le die rebese, yes anamale di anama sa, Robo bo se di arabase, ye chocolate di arabase, ye de bobo, rama masa, ye namalede, ye chodole, fire in your belly, fire in your belly, fresh fire in your belly, ye choradaba, re di anamase de edebe, yo sodole di arabasa, 
Yeso no le diarebe, yesho la male, yo roboso, rababa, yeso no le, yesha da robobose, yesoko. Thank you, Lord. Menama, yo re diabase. Glory. The way you'll be the answer to this generation is by the anointing, by the Spirit of God. Praise God.